You're talking about buying a gun to take your own life. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when I was 22, I was I was trying to buy a gun and. This week on High Performance, Danny Cipriani, as you've never heard him before. I was just this free, loving, young, conf confident, happy kid, like thrust into it. And then life was like, this is how you're meant to behave. I came out of a nightclub on a Wednesday night um, and I was playing for England on the Saturday, but I literally popped in there for 15 minutes. From then on, it was like spotlight on, you know, trying to find an escape, whatever that would have been. And for me, it was, women or it would have been taking a painkiller or whatever it would have been because that would have numbed me enough at that point to feel okay. Escaping what? My thoughts, my feelings, my, my not feeling good enough, you know, the way people spoke about me, like I felt very alone a long time. Do you feel that rugby saw you for what you were and allowed you to flourish? It's not, it's not the sport let me down, I just, I feel like no one really sat me down or put an arm around me or spoke to me about early on when I was in, in the newspapers all the time going and going and was like, how are you, Danny? Like, how's it going? Someone to like, show me love. You know, we, we lost the baby at 27 weeks, which is tough, but the beauty is he brought us together, my wife and I, and he gave me a chance to be here and be like, this is who I am. I, I always start with what is high performance, but I want to start a bit differently actually okay. today. We will get to that point, but I think for someone who so many people have had an opinion about and who's yeah. been in the public eye for so many years and has got such a fascinating story, I'm interested in just knowing how you feel now about doing things like this. Like what does, yeah. what does today um, draw out of you emotionally? Do you know what? It's funny because coming into it, there's, I have these old feelings of like sitting in an interview and saying what I meant to say and talking how I'm meant to talk. And even now, like, I feel this like energy going through me of like, fuck, you got to say the right thing, right? But that isn't the way that I want to live my life. That's not who I am because I've been told my whole life who I am and what I am through all my errors and my mistakes and not, not my mistakes, but experiences. And I can even feel myself getting like going into it now. Um, and what does that do for you then when you go into that? Does it remove the truth in some, or the real you? It, it doesn't remove the truth like previously it would have. Like yeah. I, I guess when you see a lot of athletes give interviews, it's very straight down the line. Um, but but for me, it was like, you know what? The playing side of it was easy. Not easy. I don't want to disrespect the work and the effort and everything that goes into it and the hours and so on. And, you know, when school finished, when I was 17, I'd get on a train for an hour and a half, do sprint training, get home at 9 p.m., all that stuff is all well and good. But the playing side of it for me was the easier part because mm. I was able to be free of thought. I was able to lock into what I was doing. Um, the difficult part was afterwards was like how I felt, how tormented I feel. I had to always be distracted. You know, I had shame, I had fear, I had all these things going on. And, you know, being written about from such a young age, it's not when you had an opportunity to respond as well it makes you sort of believe what people are saying about you, but it's a snippet of your life. It's yeah. part of your life. It's not who you are. And then comes entitlement, then becomes anger, then comes, you know, people talking about you. And then you get this backup and you're like, oh no, F them, it's them. They shouldn't be talking about me like that. Like, why do they always pull a story out just before England selection? Like, you know, my phone was tapped for seven years. Like there's crazy stuff that's gone on. I would get this blame mentality because you're feeling like everyone's on you. Yeah. But ultimately you have to look at self too. And you know, the way I was behaving and, and the things I was doing, it's not a right or wrong thing, but my life sent me that way because I was looking for that. I was looking for that feeling, that dopamine effect, that love, that affection or whatever it might've been. And I had to understand that truly before I could become who I am today. Like, you know, happy, you know, I feel like I've reversed time. I'm, I feel like I'm 20 again, like before all the stories happened. And um, just sitting here and speaking about it, so like I've never done this. Like it feels strange, you know. Emotional. Well, clearly. <laughs> like, yeah. It's coming so, out of me. Wh where's that come from then? Um, I guess it's just for so long, 
I didn't feel like I was good enough. I didn't feel valued. I would like walk down the street, like especially when I was like 22, 23 and people would look at me and straight away I'd be like, what are they saying about me? And as soon as they lock eyes and double lock eyes, I'm thinking, oh, they're saying something bad about me straight away. And that's how I felt then. But I don't now. And it's okay for me to feel the emotion yeah. and go through it. And that's why I'm in the process of doing this. Um, so it, for me, I've got a real passion about athletes being able to express themselves truly. And it's something I never felt I could. And whenever you see a bit of emotion being shown by an athlete, you know, the media jump on them. Look at Anthony Joshua after his fight. Like, might not have been the right time, might not have been the right thing to say, but there was a true sense of him coming out. Like, let's let's dive into that. Let's let's celebrate that. And I just feel like, man, you walk around with a straight jacket a long, a long time, especially in this country and the way things are viewed. So one of the people that I spoke to before we met was Brian Ashton, mm. who spoke about you were somebody that really responded to having questions asked of you and being able to pose the answers. So tell us before we get into the interview then, Danny, what questions should we be asking of you to give you this platform to, to give the best version of you? Uh, I don't know, just a human conversation, man. Like, I'm sure I'll warm up into it and I'll get into it. And, you know, I, I feel as soon as you put cameras and mics in front of people, it's a different feel, yeah. isn't it? And, you know, I've always been trying to get to the top or play for England or be seen to be doing the right things, especially because my off-field behaviour at time would put me in a certain bracket. And, you know, I'd, I I firstly had to accept a lot of things internally and, and myself to to be able to sit here and, you know, gi give this type of interview that I, I want to give. Um, so the right question is a difficult one. It's just us going through the story, talking about it, whatever comes up, the, the good times, the sad times, the emotions, like I'm willing to express and be vulnerable with all because I'm very comfortable with who I am now. I'd love to go back to the freedom that yeah. you had as a young guy. And even when I say that word, you're like a smile on I your face. I feel it now. I feel it now. Like, I feel the freedom still like, brilliant. to this day. Like, for a long time I didn't, but for sure, like it's back. So you're back to having that freedom. I suppose my heart breaks for you a bit, if I'm totally honest, <laughs> because, you know, there's lots of parents in this room and we all want amazing things for our kids. And my wife is a big rugby fan. Dreams of the day our boy plays rugby, right? And I look at your story and I think, you had so much freedom. The dream arrived and things happened that removed all the joy. And it's only afterwards when that moment was gone and it would never come back that you can find the freedom again. And for you to sit here and have a smile on your face is like incredible bravery and a huge respect to you for that. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm heartbroken for the fact that things conspired and you made decisions and things were stacked up that took those golden moments away from you. Uh, yeah. I just would love to go back to the, the the period of freedom and work out how this happened. Well, like firstly, I'm not heartbroken about it, so don't be yeah. for me because how have you let go of that then? It's those experiences were what I needed. I needed to face those. I needed to grow into who I am now. I didn't have the traditional patern paternal and maternal framework or guidance from my parents to be like certain things. You know, I was just this free, loving, young, conf confident, happy kid, like thrust into it. And then life was like, this is how you're meant to behave. I'm like, but I am behaving. Boom, no, this is how you're meant to behave, whether it be a story or whether it be whatever's happening. And When did that first happen then? Uh, well, probably when I came out of a nightclub on a Wednesday night um, and I was playing for England on the Saturday, but I literally popped in there for 15 minutes. And on the back of that, I was on the front page the next day and Brian himself had to not select me because of the pressure he was feeling from the RFU. Oh, we can't be seen to be doing that. I understand it, like poor decision. I get that. But then from then on, it was like spotlight on. It, it started at 16 when I was in the National Academy with Brian. But from then on, it was like properly on. And then the experience of like going out with people that were well known and going in that environment, like that was all, all part of it. But um, I don't feel sad for any of those moments or I've not really? lost anything because it's created the person that I am now and and the emotions and the turns and the ties, the ups and the downs, everything I've been through, like, and how I'm still sat here happy and confident, like, I, I feel untouchable in that sense because Brilliant. 
you know, vulnerability is strength and you don't, you don't see it. You don't see it, especially in our country. You don't see athletes coming across and doing that as much. Um, and there's lots of reasons why, and I'm sure we'll get into it, you know, at a later date in this, in this, um, conversation. Um, but yeah, I think vulnerability is I'm key. I'm so pleased you say that. I mean, and that is a true sign of strength. Yeah, definitely. But take us back to that period when you said, I didn't grow up with a traditional mm. maternal, paternal background. What did you grow up with? Well, um, yeah, when I was like, I'm, I'm mixed race and my dad's black and my mum's white, but obviously I'm white skin. So had lots of confusion around that growing up, but you know, I was just happy, like happy guy, just doing whatever. And then- What I, was what was the, the confusion around that? Explain that well, to people. For me, I felt more connected to the black side of my family because there was my dad and there was all my cousins, auntie, uncles, but yet I'm white skin. So I would always kind of gravitate towards, you know, my best friend's black. Like it's, it's just the way it was. Um, and then you feel like you're too white for your black friends or you're too black for your white. It's just an odd feeling that you would have felt, you know, at different points when I was younger. Um, Did you never feel that you quite belonged anywhere? I think that is a, an underlying feeling I would have felt a lot because I grew up in a counter state then ended up playing rugby, going to good schools. So my environment was very different to the rest of the rugby players. So I wasn't as good as you know, keeping my mouth closed and saying, yes, sir, no, sir. If I felt a coach was being disrespectful or, or whatever it might have been, I was very honest in how I spoke, not in a rude manner, but, you know, if I have a view, you know, at my club, it was heard. At, at Wasps, it was heard. Then when I went to England and I had the same view yeah. um, at the time, say like a Martin Johnson, he didn't, he didn't, um, he didn't respond as well to it because his environment was different. Leicester was the old school mentality. You have to, shut up and put up and get along with it. And that's no discredit to him. That was just his environment. And, yep. and so that sort of relationship broke down. Um, but tell us, sorry, I don't yeah. want to interrupt. There's <laughs> so much to down. say. <laughs> but tell us, I'm, I'm really intrigued by that. Yeah. Of you growing up on a council estate and then you go into a private school that like, tell us how that felt for you. Because again, that's dislocation you describe about not feeling quite enough to fit into the black or the white community must have been exacerbated by the other kids from your estate weren't going to private schools. Kids from your private schools weren't going to your council yeah. estate. So how did that feed into I th it? I think when you're young, you don't, you're not sitting there feeling it as such, especially because sport was my connector to everything. Like when I played, you know, when I played on a Sunday at Roslyn Park, the feeling you'd get from playing well and everyone talking and being like, oh my God, did you see that? So it didn't, I didn't necessarily feel like that until later on when you get old and you reflect on these things like that was when I was just young exuberant living life you don't face your traumas till later on in life do you You don't go when you sit in silence you're like why is my brain going why is it going 100 miles an hour and thinking this and that and you know you don't sit back and reflect on your own behaviors it came out later on um so do you feel you got away with stuff then because your talent at that stage where you were going in playing for Rosin Park you were good so people would overlook things that maybe you were doing like answering back to a coach yeah but i, I wouldn't do it in a in a, like a rude way like i had this program we were toward south africa and it was under 11s and they had like a little snippet for every player and the thing it said for me like i found it the other day and it was like <laughs> uh danny is a, a wonderful talent a wonderful player and he's a keen advocate to hear what coaches have to say like and it was funny because obviously they were just laughing at the fact that if they were trying to tell me to do something on the field but i felt something different or saw something different or if they called a play and i saw something and we scored they kind of accepted it and was like cool that's danny it doesn't quite flow like that in rugby when you get older and so and so on you have to build the structure and the framework and so on around it but um, at 11, you were, you had that self-confidence just to but go it, in your own it way. It didn't feel like self-confidence. I was just being who I was, you know, when you're, you don't feel like I'm a confident kid. I was just living like that's the, the way I, I operated you. I was, I was in it. And, um, and yeah, it was except like, even at school, I remember I got in trouble with my history teacher and, um, he was ahead of year and he took me to the headmaster's office and he was being really stern with me and he was like, we're going. And I was like, okay. We go and we sat down and the headmaster was like, so Danny, how's the rugby going? And I remember the headmaster behind me being, uh, the, the head of year being so angry because he was like allowing me to get away with whatever. So I guess there was a sense of that when you're doing well, going well, oh, things are happening. I'm getting scholarships. I'm 
it's working, but when you're in it, you're not yeah, viewing yeah. it like that. We've sat here and had a conversation with Marcus Waring, the chef, about how school let him down because he wasn't like everybody else. Mm. We've spoken to Alex Scott, who felt let down at school because she wasn't like everybody else. Mm. I'd love to explore this sense of embracing difference and then, and allowing people to flourish rather than making everyone fit into the same mold. Like, yeah. you know, you're this outgoing, confident, fascinating, brilliant, talented young guy and you walk into the world of rugby. Do you feel that rugby saw you for what you were and allowed you to flourish? Or do you feel that rugby looked at you and thought, you don't fit the mold of a rugby player. We need to mold you into what's expected. It's, it's, it's tough for me to say because, you know, with some of the things that were going on and, and the, the, the experiences I was having, which would be front page news or negative news stories. As a coach, I guess you can see, and that looks a little bit like a risk. Like it doesn't feel like it's going the right way. So I have to take acceptance and accountability of that and, and, and realize that I can't sit here pointing the fingers at rugby and everything. Yeah. Otherwise that's not going to be any remotely beneficial to me. So I had to feel that, but do I have, I felt limitations within the sport for sure. Like it's often spoke about, you know, the diversity and so on, you know, it's, 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 a uh, it's not, it's not the sport let me down. I just, I feel like no one really sat me down or put an arm around me or spoke to me about early on when I was in, in the newspapers all the time going and going and was like, how are you, Danny? Like, how's it going? I was just kind of left to my own devices as I was as a kid. So again, I'm having to figure out all these things. I'm having to search, I'm having to look. And, you know, I've got certain coaches in my life, like you say, Brian Ashton or Sean Edwards. You know, I'm goddad to his daughter. Um, Steve Black, who came into my life at 24. <laughs> he recently passed. Yeah. He's a good man. And I can feel the emotion. I'm cool with it. Um, but yeah, he came into my life when I needed someone to like, show me love and and ultimately that's what it was um stemming from what from what just needing love stemming yeah, from what just because i felt so unlovable myself because of all these errors that were happening all these mistakes and these things and how they were speaking about me in the media and it was like the view then you see things and you hear things and as much as you want to like break free from it it's still there like it was at that point until you get comfortable and understand it's just part of the journey and the emotion can come through me when I'm speaking, but it doesn't mean I sit home thinking about it, ever sad about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's yeah. speaking about a time that was then. And I can sit here and do that about, I don't even want this to be like a somber interview <laughs> about me. Like, Oh my God, I'm sad. No, it's, I, it's not the way I'm just speaking yeah, about I, past experience exactly. and things that were then. Yep. Um, so why were you, what was all this about then? I'm really interested for people that don't know the story. Like mm. explain to us, what were you doing and what was the reaction? What was I doing? Like, you know, I've, I've been in a paper a lot about, you know, my personal life with, 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 with women and such and mistakes like, you know, in issues that uh, had just happened and it was on the front page and it was just negative stories. It was just decision-making that, it wasn't even decision making. I felt like it was who I was in my program and I was just doing it. And, and to like face yourself in those moments, you push it down. You don't, you don't, you don't sit there and be like, what am I doing? You just carry on behaving in a certain way, you know, trying to find an escape, whatever that would have been. And for me, it was, um, you know, it would have been women or it would have been taking a painkiller or it would have been, you know, whatever it would have been because that would have numbed me enough at that point to feel okay. Escaping what? My thoughts, my feelings, my, my not feeling good enough, you know, the way people spoke about me, like I felt very alone a long time, but that's also because I wasn't really facing myself and accepting and looking at myself and not taking accountability for my behaviors as well as just the life I was in, you know. I was speaking to my physio about it the other day about, a lot of my experiences and like he's an angel of a human being. Kevin Lidlow is a shout out. He's just an angel with type of physio who put his hands on you and he'll know exactly what's up with you. But I was speaking to him and he was like, I don't think you should take so much pressure on yourself because you know, you're in a position where 
women put themselves in front of you. But I'm like, ultimately, I wouldn't want my son or my daughter behaving in that way because I want to bring them up with the right type of um, love and, and care and focus for everyone. And it's not, I didn't have that. I was just quite entitled, confident, living my life and not really being guided in how to behave or anything, you know, so. But can I ask you, like mm. some of the stories, say like your involvement with, with, uh, with women. Yeah. Did that give you kudos in the dressing room? So we're talking about how coaches might have viewed you skeptically, but amongst your peer group, were they sort of looking at you with a bit of envy, a bit of ad uh, uh, admiration, patting you on the back, thinking that what you were doing was brilliant? I guess there was jokes and stuff about it and, and like people would speak about it, but not in like a negative way or a, it was just part of the, the, the change room humor, I guess. Sure. But then did that give you that sense, that feeling of love that you were looking for? Because nobody's condemning you in the dressing room for, for some of these antics, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I guess it probably gave me a sense of like, you're, you're a man, you're doing it. But like, ultimately you don't feel good internally about it. Sure. You know, it's just, you have this bravado, this mask that you're wearing and you're, you're going through life. And in those environments, it's like, yeah, I guess it's so, it's such a ego macho bravado change room as a rugby environment, as you can tell. Yeah. And I'm always trying to find my way to fit my way to, to be also the leader because naturally my position is that. So not only by the way I'm playing, but the way people treat me off the field. And I guess there might've been a part of it, but ultimately it's, it stemmed from my own internal struggle that I was behaving in that way. Yeah. And I'm interested in, in actually what the impact is of all this sort of stuff, because I think that often we're fooled into thinking just because someone's in the public eye, they deserve criticism or scrutiny or they deserve to be put on the front page of the paper. It comes with the job, right? Is the old mm. adage. Can you really tell us the true cost of that level of scrutiny at what is still an immature age? You know, you're 20, early 20s. I'm 34, but thank you. I, then, I look, oh, I'm sorry, man, I thought you were looking at saying I look yeah. young. Damn. You do, oh, you do, you look good <laughs> yeah, you for your age. Well. Yeah. But when you were in your 20s and your early 20s. The cost of it, it's people taking their lives, mate. Do you know what I mean? Like the cost of it's heavy and I lived through it with someone I cared about and like C Caroline and what she went through and she was full, full of shame and regret and all these things. Everyone feels that. Everyone goes through that. But because you're on this pedestal, you don't feel like you can talk or be or share or whatever it is. And it's like, it's not real. And I felt compelled after that to, to, speak things I'd been holding back for a long time and because I didn't want people to think that was the way out because when I was 22 I felt like that was the way out so it was so personal you suicide. suicide yeah suicide man like that's that's the cost of it if you don't you know and for some people it's fortunate you meet someone or you have an experience and you don't go down that route but and what stopped you? Um, well, <laughs> when I was twenty-two, I um, I was I was trying to buy a gun, and the guy I was trying to buy it off, he um, he was a bit of a gangster in London and whatever, and I would try and get it, and he'd cancel it. I'd cancel it because I was like, no. <laughs> Just to be clear for people, you're talking about buying a gun to take your own life. Yeah. Um, and he didn't know why. He just thought I wanted wanted a gun in that sense. And um, I kept saying yes and then saying no and bailing on him. Obviously, that's getting in my rate. So he sold all the pictures and the messages to the Sun newspaper. So the Sun newspaper wanted to do a front page story. Dancy Brown's trying to buy a gun. And my psychiatrist had to come in and be like, I never spoke about this, so it's yeah. weird to have these emotions. I don't feel sad, so don't Fine. don't worry about that. Um, but yeah, when, when that happened, it was like, phew, I'm glad it happened because the other way is the other way. Um, and then like sport's beautiful, man, because you can, 
think about the next game, the next session, the next thing. Like there's so many things. If you get a passion in life, like commit to it, commit to it, live and die into it because it will reveal what it needs to reveal internally about yourself and so on. It's not just the passion of doing something. So that that's what happened in that situation. And they weren't allowed to print it because it was stopped by a psychiatrist. But, you know, it's it's that type of thing that, needs to get addressed and looked at because the way the media run, the way they control things, the way they speak, the narrative of the whole country, athletes and so on, like they may look shiny and glamorous and everything's going well, but you don't know the damage it's doing. Yeah. So take know? us beyond the headlines then, Danny, because mm. that's pretty shocking to yeah, hear. Yeah, I know. You know that I know, yeah. You're a 22-year-old lad, the headline that you good looking lad, you're successful, you're doing well at rugby, you're in the England team, you, you, the, you've got the world at your feet and yet you're telling us that you're making some serious efforts there to take your own life. Take us into that of what precipitated it, What what where did those thoughts come from? You mentioned that you're working with a psychiatrist at that moment, so where did that intervention start to come into your world? Yeah, a lot of it was just, the feeling of like, like I said, walking down the street and having people look at you and have the feeling that everyone's saying something negative about you. Your your own self-worth is like in the gutter. And as much as people can say you're good looking and you have a career and things are going well, like you don't sit there and go, well, I'm good looking and I have a career and I'm, do you know what I mean? Like it no, just no, don't right. happen like that. So you, you're not truly appreciative of what you have. And, you know, appreciation and gratitude is one of like the first steps of like coming out of a lot of this where you can okay. sit down and you can list all the things you're grateful for, like even the smallest things the, to the biggest things. But tell us about the psychiatrist. Where did you seek out that help? I, I realised I needed to speak to someone because I didn't have a maternal, paternal figure to go speak to. I didn't have, I didn't have a brother. Or, you know, I had an unbelievable coach in Sean Edwards who looked after me like a son. Yeah. But those you know we spoke about a lot of things i just you know to take that step and tell people it's like you feel this shame Sean you advise you to go and no see. he didn't advise me to go i'm just i'm saying like i had people around that were great but um i i was like i knew i had to go and see someone because of the thoughts i was having and the way that i was thinking right. and rugby was my escape so when you talk about high performance it's like you know that was the easy bit that was the bit that made me feel alive that was a bit that made me feel worthy but then as soon as it stopped it's like bang you're straight back into it so how do you how do you figure yourself out how do you figure out your own desires and your own traumas to to sit here in a place of peace like you know so, so what kind of discussions were you having with your psychiatrist and what kind of lessons were you learning that, that could help you do you know what with the psychiatrist it it didn't feel it, <sighs> it didn't feel relatable when someone's sitting there with a clipboard and you know, for me, f the best thing for me was when I met Steve Black, right? And and he spoke on a human level and he saw me for me and I was like, You've, we've only just met and you're saying all these things that are, re are relatable to me. Like what? Um, just from what he'd seen and the talent and the, and the way I played and you know, the snippets he would have seen of me and you know, saying I was like a lovable good guy and all this. And like, you don't feel that about yourself in those moments. Like, well, I didn't. Um, and, but yet my focus is always on the performance. It's always on going there. So at work and at game day, it's fine. It's that home time period of how do I, how do I find peace within this? Um, and, you know, I remember I met Steve in, in Manchester. I thought we was gonna meet for like half an hour. We sat down for four hours. I came away, I was like, I love that man, like, wow. And we started our relationship, like we'd meet every week, speak all the time. And and I've had other key part people in my life that I've met that have taught me so many things and you can learn from, but you you have to listen to the voice inside. You have to listen to what what that's saying. And you also have to recognize that your thoughts then they're, they're not they're not true and, and things like meditation and and things like searching into spirituality for me have like, have brought me the most amount of peace, man. And it's been my quest, my desire, my search my whole life for more, for these things. So what's been the most effective? It's an accumulation because 
I can't say MB is one thing, it's people you love, it's opening up, it's being able to talk, it's sharing, it's, it's doing it with people you trust, um, you know, and, and getting to a point where you don't mind sharing in a public arena, but you start off by talking to people you trust and letting them, letting them know how you feel because it feels like, how do I get over this? As soon as you share, you drop that mask, you be vulnerable, someone responds back in the same way. It happens all the time. And if that person turns around and says something negative, you don't want them in your life because that's not a good friend or a good person to be around, you know? And everyone has their start to life. Everyone has their own experiences, their own traumas, everything they go through, you know, insecurities, fears, worries. Um, but I believe it's your own individual job to become the best version of yourself. And that doesn't mean to be the guy to play for England or to get the money and do that because that's not a fulfilling place to be. Like when I was doing that, I didn't feel super fulfilled. It was momentary and I can't really remember those amazing moments anyway. It's, it's in the it's in memory, that's it. And, it, and you relay it uh, in a different way to what it was then anyway. I was so intrigued into meeting like family men and their, and their environments and how it looked. And I went to a Malibu when I was like 25 and yeah, it's a beautiful, glamorous place, but I met a guy called Laird Hamilton, like this strong macho, surfer who surfs 100 foot waves but is like the most beautiful and kind father to his daughters and his wife and people around and it was like man that's that's cool and the way he would speak was so open and vulnerable mm. and it just it brings it out of you so you immediately create a connection where it's like this feels freeing this feels open it's not either of you wearing a mask and you can have that with people you love like take those steps yeah. of so which has convos. been the environment you've been into where you have felt you really truly belong? You can drop the mask, you can be yourself. I, I felt it as a youngster when I was playing, like for sure. I went into like the most successful WAS team. Um, and, you know, Sean used to say, call us like an, an orphanage of just r random, uh, an accumulation of people, different people with different walks of life. And, you know, we didn't have the most strict training regime, but on Saturday, everyone turned up and it was just a really good feel. It was, it was an unbelievable environment to go into. Um, but like, as things happen in sport, it changes all the time. So you don't hold on to that forever. You have new experiences, new people, and you come up against different hurdles. Uh, so, so that, that felt great. Um, and again, going back to what's the second time was great for me because we had a change room, which, you know, was, we had like 10, 12 people in our change room and it was like our safe space and everyone got really close and it was a beautiful environment. Um, but again, I wasn't in a position then like I am now being able to speak about these things. I was still going through what I was going through in life and, you know, the performance never really wavered when I came back from Australia at 24. It was, it was at a high level, but then I wasn't getting what I wanted to get. I wasn't playing for England and there were so many things that were coming up against me. And, you know, I had to accept a lot of it, but there was things that were like, were, were out of my control. And again, you dive deep, you dive internally, like how can you find peace with it? How can you be happy and enjoy that that happened? Because there's a lesson, there's something to learn from everything. Um, and that's how I handle things now. And that's how I view things, the, the experiences, I'm excited for them. Whether this comes across great or bad, it's not in my control. I can just speak my truth and be truthful and, and vulnerable in that sense. And, and the rest of it's not really down to me. So there, there will be some of your former coaches listening to this. I've mm. no doubt. What, what advice would you give them that maybe they could have done to create an environment and a culture that would have allowed you to thrive? Uh, well, I've studied a lot of this. I've looked at different coaches and sportsmen and people and, you know, the best coaches are the ones that are the most emotionally intelligent, right? Sean Edwards, unbelievably so. He's lived life, he's been through it. He will share and you will go and, and do everything for him because he's as vulnerable and open with you as you are with him, you know? But there is a, a culture in rugby of being the man or the macho or the, or the you know, coming across like you know it. You know, and that can feel good, like you think you know it, but ultimately you don't, we don't. It's like having that tie to a coach and being able to share and 
have that emotion. You know, you don't see that so much in rugby. There's certain coaches across the league that definitely get it right. You know, it's not the whole sport as a whole. You know, not everyone can be Pep Guardiola. Not everyone can get that emotional engagement with his athletes. Um, but it's, it's, that's where it needs to go. That's where it needs to grow. That's where you need to see it. And in doing so, performances will skyrocket. You'll see more creativity on the field. You'll see it looking more like artwork. And people will generally be happier and not having to just like come to work, get on with it and, and get out because there's a lot of unhappy people within it as there is in life, you know? Um, and what do you think inhibits people from doing what Sean Edwards did for you of being vulnerable and emotional Your own personal work, your own internal work of what you go through, what you experience and, and how you view it. Are you in a blame culture? Are you, are you not accepting, you know, this position you're in? You know, are you not being truthful? Are you trying to hold a facade? Are you wearing a mask? Like all these are like emotionally intelligent conversations to have internally with yourself um, and not feel like, oh yeah, I've got it. Everyone's got it. Like, you know, everyone doesn't, like we, we have that, like I say, facade that people um, carry. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's just connecting a bit deeper as a, as a group and, you see that in some of the best performances. You see that when you see a South African team and they're rooted in history and, and heritage and they live and they die for each other. And it's like, how do you create that? How do you do that? Well, I'm interested. You, you mentioned South Africa. We had, we were lucky enough to have Sia Khaleesi on the podcast who spoke around when he took over as a leader. It was all about vulnerability of that theme of Ubuntu. I am because you are so... I'll be my authentic self mm -hmm. to allow you to do That's that. That's beautiful, man. So can you give us some tips on what you've experienced that if people wanted, the might be listening to this, say, in the classroom as a teacher or as a business leader or even as a father uh, of a family like Jake and I are, what can we do to create emotional intelligence in our own spaces? I think... You know, the, when you're trying to teach or you're trying to discipline or you're trying to show, you, you, you streamline your behaviours along that. But when you're in a, in a two-way relationship, whether it be a, a child or a player or, or a student, you know, that's the type of relationship where you're open and you're vulnerable and you're, you're honest and you share your truth and you behave as such and you are truthful and so on and so on. That's something to look up to and lead by, as well as the feeling you get as a as a player or a student or a child would be you feel engaged, you feel seen, you feel part of it, you feel like we're going through. And I know it, it's easy to, uh, to 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 think you have to discipline and to do these things. And of course, there will be moments, you know, that that happens. Um, but it, the only thing that we have on them is age. Like there's no title that gets given oh dad or mum you're still human being you're just older and you've you've learned a bit more so how would you deliver that to a, a child or a student or a player like how would you share your true experiences your pitfalls so I feel like I know this person I know that guy I'm going out for them all week you know I'm, I'm going to put my body on the line I'm going to commit I'm going to do these things um you know because you can feel the disconnect. Like I felt it in so many different ways in my life. Um, and I'm trying to live my truest authentic self and, 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 and be as real as I can. And in doing so, you know, magic happens, man. I, I married a beautiful woman, like amazing. Like I never thought that'd ever be my story. Um, Why not? Because I was in that program of behaving the way I was and, I remember when I was young, I had older athletes, senior players telling me like, stay single, Danny, play the field. And like, I'm, I'm an impressionable 17, 18 year old kid. I listened to that. I'm like, okay, all right, I'll go do that. And I did that. <laughs> like, do you know what I mean? And it didn't cause me happiness and fulfillment. You know, it can hit your ego and you can feel like this and that, but like, you don't ever want to have that manipulation power on someone else because that's what it is really when you're in a scenario but you know what the truth is and you know you don't want to commit but I'm going to manipulate you so I can get what I want and it's like as much as you want to behave like that 
that's going to bear on your soul at some point. And what was the moment when you did finally face, like look in the mirror and realize I don't like what I'm doing here? Man, like life intervened. I, I met my wife, you know, we got pregnant. Um, well, she did. I didn't, <laughs> uh, I, I was part of it. And uh, <laughs> then, you know, I committed and I said that, you know, I want to get to know you to the best of my ability. And she did the same. I was vulnerable and open. And it was the first time I was like, this is me. This is everything I got. And first we did it on the phone because in a different country for a long time. And in doing so, I fell in love with her in two weeks on the phone. I was like, I can't wait to go back and see her. Got back, spent every day with her. And it's like, doesn't mean it's perfect every day but you're still bringing your own past and your own issues to the relationship but the commitment and the space she held for me to be loved and show me who I am really allowed me to come into my own step into who I am who I feel I've always been and yeah a special man <laughs> how old were you when you said that to her this is this is who I am this is me being vulnerable uh, like 31 half two, 32 so that's a that's a long life to live without opening up like that for people who are still in the place where you were a decade before that how freeing is it to say that what would your advice be to them you know you know around you who loves you that's always been a, a question of mine because of my life with my dad leaving and my mum not being you know, you, you never get what you want as a kid, no matter what, everyone's got their own thing. There's no slight on my mum. She's a great woman in, in everything that she is, but you want that affection, that love, that kindness, whatever it is. And- And you didn't have that. No, I, 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 I didn't. And, but she was great in so many other ways. That was just the way she showed love. And until you can reflect and really understand it, you can't speak the truth on it and you mask over it and you cover it. Um, so to feel lovable or like I mattered or whatever it was, I hate the fact that these emotions are coming up, but I don't hate it because it's real, like it's cool. <laughs> um, it was an issue of mine. I didn't feel that. I didn't know who I could turn to. My own mum and dad, I couldn't really turn to them. So who am I turning to? Mm. Um, I never allowed anyone close enough to really share or open up until the universe god whatever intervened and you know you know we we lost the baby at 27 weeks which is tough but the beauty is he brought us together my wife and i and he gave me a chance to be here and be like this is who i am amazing this is what I've been through. Yeah. I'm not perfect. I never claimed to be. Um, but I'm, I'm willing to bear all and be real because I feel as a culture, English culture, I feel as a sporting country, um, I, f I believe we're behind the eight ball. I believe we're behind it. We don't, the way we speak about each other um, in the media and so on, as I mentioned, I don't think it allows us to fully get into our authentic selves because we're all trying to be a type of way because we don't want people to know the truth because the truth is terrible. No, it's not. Everyone goes through the same things. It's just a different spotlight. It's a different version. You know, everyone's got something you can learn from everyone. Everyone can be relatable. Everyone has those emotions. And, you know, I, I hope that that's something that can get changed and it can do. And I see somewhere like America where I feel their athletes get to own their own narrative and they get to be more authentic. And you see the levels of performance and the genius and the talent, and the consistency, but also they have a lot of fun off the field and they make changes and they go to communities and they build and they create massive, you know, better environments for people that they were like when they were younger and so on and so on. Yeah. And I believe we miss a, a huge disconnect or a potential or an opportunity in this country to do so 
because we have this stiff upper lip mentality, this English culture, this, which has got so many positives to it, you know, you know, so many, but just relaxing and being vulnerable and being truthful. Why is that seen as such a, an outrageous thing to do in this country? Like it shouldn't be, it, it should be real. And then people aren't carrying what they carry and then people don't yeah. want to do what, you know, unfortunately people end up doing. And I think one of the most important things we can all do is, is take responsibility in this situation because I'm sure there are people listening to this going, well, the bloody media causing Danny all those problems when he was a rugby player or whatever. Yeah. But I think we all have to understand our, the, uh, the role that we all play For in sure. this. Our, our own addiction to negative news. For sure. Our own social media pylons. You know, your, your former partner and the whole, you know, be kind conversation. I'm sure that was an especially hard period for you because you'd been through this and, you know, she would no doubt have come to you to say, how can I get through this period? And you were there and I know you shared a lot with her about what you'd experienced, but ultimately it wasn't enough to save her. But I see all that. And then I see us going back to the way we were minutes, minutes later, not even days later. Yeah, you're spot on. And hate hate or anger never solves anything and us being like oh it's them and so on it's just going to create a bigger divide mm. and it will create an even more fanfare and welfare to have negative news you know on the motorway when you're driving there's a crash on the side why is there always a cure of traffic on the other way because they want to see like it's in our nature but also you know how do we change that how do we have these open honest conversations because Consciousness is moving around us everywhere. Everyone's becoming more awake or aware or whatever it might be. And, you know, I just feel like we can make create a shift. Like there is so many platforms and opportunities for us to do so. We, 20 years ago when I started, I, I couldn't have put a tweet out after a negative story because it didn't exist. I didn't, I couldn't create a show or do an interview or give a video and say what I wanted to say. So as much as there is a lot of negativity around the social media and the, you know, comparing yourself to others, there can also be lots of beauty within it, like everything. And being true, being honest and being open, you know, not only do other people benefit because they feel more comfortable, you benefit right. because you realize you're not carrying this weight, this jacket, this lead, you know, I walk down the street and I, I say hello to everyone I meet with a smile on my face. Like, he must think I'm a crazy guy, but from where I was, I say hello every day. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just the way I feel now. Um, my wife laughs at me because like, when we go to Thailand, I'm always like bowing and saying hello to people and just getting into their way of culture and their way of things and, you know, but I love that, man. Like, it's real. I mean, as I'm listening to you, Danny, I, I, the thought keeps coming into my head that I think your talent has got in the way of you discovering this for so long. I think people have forgiven you lots of things because you're a talented rugby player and, you know, and then when you maybe sometimes don't live up to the talent, that, that seeing you as a human being and your fallibilities and your own rawness has almost been neglected. So then that's why you felt like these horrible moments mm. of considering suicide and things and things like that, feeling hollow at the heart of it. I, so I'm interested as, sorry. No, go on, go on. No, go on. I'm interested as to, one, why would you consider going back into a world where those perceptions of, can he still do it on the rugby field? He's going to get in the way of seeing the human being behind it. But secondly, what would you do instead to start to shift the narrative of these conversations for mm. a community as a whole. I feel my talent allowed me to find out who I am though, because being in the moment was where I excelled. And I feel like I'm in that now in my walk of life, my everyday conversations, because being present is all that we have. And previously I'm living in past thoughts or I'm living in what I want to be in the future. Whereas now, where I, how I felt on the field is how I live my every day. Okay. And even till six months ago, the realizations, the understandings, the awareness of what's coming to me, it's changing all the time, you know? And 
that's beautiful. There's, you, you can't hold on to something and feel like I've got it now. Because then the next thing that comes and throws you off, you know, you realize you've got to let go again. You've just got to be who you are. And I'm now in a position where I want to go back into that world and play with this frame of mind because I won't have to do the thing to get into the zone. I can just go and enjoy it. I can go and enjoy my everyday, my interactions. I'm not trying to get somewhere or be this person or look like I've got it all figured out. Yeah. Like when it comes to understanding the game of rugby or sport, that was, that was a gift of mine. I, I didn't do anything for that. I was always going to be Danny Cipriani. I was born and I played sport and I was, it was, I wasn't very good at maths. Like there's lots of things I wasn't good at, but you know, playing sport was, was my talent. And like I say, live and die into your passion, go into it because whatever your desire is, it will allow you to figure out more about who you are too. And the reason why I want to go and play a game like rugby, which, you know, is, you know, has certain limitations with a certain perception of how it tries to upkeep, you know, to go and play in this way and be who I am, man, that would be, that would be the most beautiful thing. But I also understand that might not come. So I've got other desires. I've got other passions that I want to go and help and do. Like what? Uh, I'd love to work with young athletes, you know, especially more in the football element aside things, because when it comes to coming from that environment or, and having lots of talent and, you know, the performance never wavered. It was always my off-field stuff that happened. I understand how, you know, when I'm training it in, a, in Manchester and there's paparazzi coming because there's a new story coming out and I don't know what it is, but it's paparazzi on the side of the field taking shots on a Thursday and I got to perform on Saturday. I'll get it done. That was never the issue. It was how I was feeling internally. So in terms of understanding performance, I get it. Like... I've, I've lived it, um, but there's lots of things that I still want to learn about it. You know, that came across a bit egotistical. It wasn't, I didn't mean it to be, um, but I was just saying like, that wasn't the difficult part for me. Um, I don't think it came across egotistical. <laughs> I think it came across honest. Uh, yeah. And that's where we have to get to, but it's e even that is an example of how society makes you think, what will the perception of that comment be? Yeah, exactly. Rather than exactly. what is the truth about that comment? You know, that feeling yeah. of being judged and, Let's talk about where you're at with that then, because you know, there aren't very many professional athletes that talk in this way. And there'll be people that love this conversation and the, we know the world we live in, right? There'll be people that use this as a stick to beat you with, or they try and pick apart one little comment, take it out of context. How are you with all that now? Well, no, no one can infect, affect my, my internal feeling on myself. Um, you know, no one can, like I, becoming in control of your own faculties for me is your sole responsibility in your life because therefore you have more beautiful conversations. You yeah. have true conversations because you're not projecting your thought onto someone because you don't have a feeling about it. So if you're having a discussion or, a, uh, you know, a, not an argument, but, you know, a heated discussion with your partner or your, or your son or whatever, you, you can come at it with your true sense, mm. not any feeling of, oh, I feel like this or that, because controlling your own internal well being is everything. And, you know, whatever people want to call it awakening or spirituality or faith, um, you know, the simple reason that we're here is unexplainable. So, surely we have to go a bit deeper internally to figure out these questions and, and get some sort of insight on it. Um, and yeah, it, it, do you know what? Like, yeah, it's a different story at a different time. Oh God. I, I was just going to say like every, every club I've been to in the last, in my career, I've always been aware of how it's going or the attack situation. And I've taken a grip of it and I've been like, this is how I want it to go. And there's got some success out of it. But this, previous season recently I was able to sit back and just watch it all and in doing so I was learning so much about myself and my own things about why I wanted to speak and why what I wanted to say and these were part of the internal things that I had to look at and face and understand where's that coming from why am I wanting to do that this wasn't me going in saying look we have to play this way because I know this will get success and like I said rugby was the the easy part the enjoyable part the fun part 
But when I was sat back, the amount of things that were coming through me and my, my wife um, was the one who suggested that I don't go in there and try and run the ship and do the thing. And in doing so, I learned so much about myself that year and and so on. And it's, it's it keeps going and it keeps going. And sometimes silence is good. Sometimes mm. listening is good, you know, meditation, not even sometimes, a lot of the time, you know, if you can sit back and listen to that internal voice and not try and distract yourself and not try and numb it and not try and always be busy or playing golf every single day. Like, you know, those things are great. Those are your passions, but you've also got to recognize, am I doing this as a distraction or not? And those are the honest conversations with yourself. Those are the, the depths you need to go and, and, and where it can go with, with all of it. Uh, and what's the reason for you choosing now to talk like this? Because some people can look at the tears in your eyes and think, oh, he's still struggling with his mm -hmm. past story but i don't think that's the case at all i think like the tears are almost this sense of freedom that you've got that you're no longer there but i also sense that you've got this desire to take people with you now and open up this way of thinking to other people yeah i'd, I'd love to do that but how like that it's true what you say like people see oh, the tears and think oh that's that's soft that struggle what a facade man like yeah. again like what are we talking about here like that is such a, an archaic mentality and it, it is something that is deep embedded in our system, unfortunately, right now. And you're right, I, I do have a desire and a passion to take people this way because I know the greatness that can come on the back of it. I know with the sessions that I'm doing and the way I'm training that the outcomes are incredible but I'm not trying to get these outcomes. The, the energy state's different, you know. I, I, I train a lot with Johnny in, in what we do and you sit back and you just, you enjoy it. You're like, okay, I'm not trying to control any of this, but there's deep internal work you do to get there to allow it to come out. And, you know, there's so many moving parts in a rugby field and situation. And But for me, like the exciting part is if something happens or arises in these next six, nine months, um, going in without rugby game time, but then being able to express yourself fully, that will also be like, something's going on here so like i would love that opportunity but like i said it would take someone to take a not a risk but be open-minded and i've had some great conversations with some great coaches across the world that think and view life like that and i've seen how their team plays and what they say and i've phoned them and had great conversation with them so if the opportunity arises that's cool and you know, like you say, there'll be some people that will see it as soft and, and, or whatever the mentality might be, but it's real. You can't hide down these emotions. Like I can't, I can't tell you how happy I am every day. Really? I can't tell you how happy I am to feel these emotions and sit here and do this. I had no idea how this was going to go. You know, I had these ideas and these fears of being like, how can I talk about high performance? I didn't become the guy. And I was like, nah, you just got to be real, man. Because like I said, the performance at times definitely didn't waver. And under the pressure and the scrutiny I was under and how I felt, I'm really proud of myself for what I did. But I also can't own it because like I said, it felt like the release, the easy part. Yep. Um, but yeah, there's so many stories I could tell along the way, which uh, were putting me under this pressure and I had to go and play and it just, it became my freedom. Um, but now I feel like I live like that. Amazing. It's been an absolute pleasure to sit here and, and discuss that journey. I, like, I just want people to realise, though, just how many people are like that and how we love to pass judgment. You know, we've had conversations with Tyson Fury and Max Whitlock and uh, Alex Scott and, you know, athlete after athlete after athlete who is dying on the inside, performing on the outside, and the whole world is passing an opinion on them. And it is toxic and it is everywhere. And I don't know if it's getting better. We're, we're extremely privileged to have a platform to speak about it. And the difficult pass, part is, I feel, facing yourself, the acceptance, the responsibility, the accountability, yep. and being good with it. And then realizing I can move through that now. Mm. And, you know, the amount of spiritual things I get into and listen to and podcasts and things I'm interested in now that I never thought I'd be interested in at school. I wasn't that way I, I wasn't interested in that way of thinking but you know the the things I, I go into now fascinate me and it, 
lots of it it makes you feel you feel the words you don't just read them and see them and that's that internal work but like i said we're privileged to come and speak and share these things it shouldn't be it shouldn't be a a worry or an issue you shouldn't be having to control everything so my athlete doesn't look like he's stepping out of line because ultimately everyone makes mistakes and it doesn't mean that you can just speak your truth and continue behaving in, as such because the only person that will struggle or issue or have issue with that is yourself your own internal you can't you can't lie to yourself you you, you can't mm. and the more true you are the more honest you are the more you accept it and the way you can move through it i believe it's our opportunity to it's our privilege to share our stories because i'm comfortable walking down the street after this having people see me shed a tear like you know when when caroline passed you know i i felt compelled to to let people know that's not the way yeah and you know it could it might have been seen as not a good career move and it probably wasn't because when i went back to my club i felt so vulnerable yeah. i was i was playing in a great team but i'm walking around feeling like people don't really know how to handle me now like you you'd f look like yeah, a loose yeah. cannon in, in an environment so well, because you that, spoke out about well, Caroline's death. Well, on the Monday, I, I spoke to them about all the things that I ended up pretty much speaking about on that because I just had to shake it off. I was like, it's too much. It's too much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I left my contract early, but all the stories around it were Danny again. He never settles in. He did this or did that. It's none of that. I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't feel... I was able to go and express myself truly because I didn't feel like I could get respected or lead a team when that wasn't the scent, that wasn't the energy I was feeling. Because the season before, we went to playoffs. We killed it. They, I got Players Player of the Year. It was amazing. I didn't feel anything from it because I was exhausted at the end of it. Mm. But the narrative around me leaving was so negative. And again, Danny's done this and Danny's done that. So there's so many stories I could sit here and, and answer, but there's no, I've got no desire to because it's gone, it's memory. Yeah. But I can come here and speak my truth. Almost headbutted the mic then. <laughs> um, but I can come here and speak my truth. And in doing so, you know, if it makes people feel a type of way, great. But I sit here happy, man. So can I ask you about some of these truths then? Because What ones? Let's go. Well, well, this is what I've, I've, uh, I want to because... When I was talking to people that follow the sport mm. and I said, oh, we're interviewing Danny. Have you got any questions? Is there anything you'd like to, <laughs> yeah. you'd like to ask or no? And if I asked five people, right, I'd say out four of them didn't ask anything about the rugby. It was all about asking about that time he got hit with the bus, asking him about when he got arrested in Jersey, ask him, and, and it was all perceptions of you from, the, from media headlines mm. that, and what I'd, I'd like to do is, because that's not the impression I have of you sat here meeting today. So what what's the biggest misconception about you that people that are drawn to those headlines, mm. what would you like to say to them? I don't know, just watch this interview, I guess, and make your own mind up. There's, there's nothing I can say to them to change their view and it's not, it's not in my makeup. Like there definitely was a time that I felt a desire to do that. But let's just hold back on the judgment as a human being because if you're a judgmental person, yeah. guess who else you're judging yourself? You know, you're judging your own day-to-day -day interactions, the way you look physically and all these different things. Because if you are outwardly like that, you're internally like that. You can't mask either or, or do it. It has to be a, a collective so for your own sake, don't do that, you know, because I promise you when you aren't walking the street judging others, you might start seeing the beauty in others and the beauty in life. Um, and I hope that for everyone, man. Like, you know, I hope that for whatever situation I've been in and, and whatever I faced. And at, uh, definitely a time in my life, if I did this interview y a couple of years ago, I would have come across so angry and bitter at certain coaches and things, but like, I'm grateful and appreciative for it all because I, und I understood it was for me to learn and grow through and, and become. And yeah, some things perhaps didn't pan out how I wanted it to pan out, but 
you know what? I, I, I sat peacefully. Um, I sit peacefully at night and uh, life's going to come. It doesn't mean I've got it sorted at all. Like no doubt other things are going to happen in the world where it affects you. But my ability to handle it now, I believe is in a, a much better state. And it doesn't mean that it's always great, but the consistency of my happiness is, is unparalleled to how I used to feel. And my desire, my need for numbing myself or this, I don't have that. You know, I wake up at five, I do a meditation and I feel great afterwards. And my day's great. My interactions are great. Even if they might be a bit conflicting and you have those conversations with your wife and your son and your friends, man, <laughs> I'm loving life. So if you're going to have those judgments, watch this and see how you feel. And if it makes you feel a type of way, great. And if not, great. Great answer. It's interesting though, isn't it? The people are so fascinated by that. Like, why does it, actually, why does it matter? It's kind of under total irrelevance to their life, isn't it? But it's this voyeuristic obsession with like, what are other people doing? How are they doing? Yeah. I, f I feel the media do it because, I don't know, it's, if you're doing that, it kind of makes you feel like, okay about your own life because that guy's really fucking up. Do you know what I mean? And, <laughs> you know, Again, more open accountability and sharing and speaking and being vulnerable and taking that away. Our news would look different. You know, it would it would be more inviting. And it's not like I'm saying this and our country's booming because it's not like economically and all that stuff and whatever you want to get into. Um, but we've got an unbelievable opportunity to, as an athlete, to share your story and be real. And I think... If I saw that when I was young, it would have changed my game. Would have, I would have had something to, yeah. that would have been different, you know? And I particularly look at our young footballers because we've got some unbelievably talented players, but they're having to turn it on and off. And you see that with the way they interview. And now you've got to go be a genius. And now you've got to be in a straight jacket. It, it doesn't work like that. It's difficult to stay on that and keep doing that because life will come at you. Life stories will happen. You see that with really talented kids, you know, the Phil Foden's and the Jacks and how everyone gets onto it. It's like, how are they meant to go and fulfill themselves and, and live and be their greatest potential, their truest potential, if we're constantly trying to claw back at them to make them feel like us in a negative sense, but they, they are just like us. They have the same emotions. Let's be real open and honest and find out what they are. We might create an even better sports environment. We might create athletes that kids really look up to not just because of the talent they've got because of the human they are and what they faced and open these conversations and in doing so i reckon you could change a whole nation in their mentality and what you're doing like if people really understood the stories about and you people were open up and being true and how do we start this though because like, like, we're with you on this <laughs> like we're on the same page here and conversations like this will help people but this is just three people and yeah the people that watch or listen like yeah there's it feels so deep rooted in us, the negativity, the toxicity, the anger, yeah. the resentment, the jealousy. It's yeah. like, let's see them fail. Let's build them up and mm. kill them. Let's criticize them. And then also expect them to be free and play really well <laughs> yeah. and thrive. And like, how do we even begin to unpick this? I mean, I think this is a great start. Well, I think, yeah, just athletes but, coming on. You said you had like Scott and Tyson Fury and people doing this and, and, and that's great. And, you know, the, the things I'm really passionate about that, you know, I'm going to dive deeper into as, as time goes on and, you know, hopefully we can start creating things which look like that, shows that look like that, that people really want to buy into and, and understand and you guys are doing it and it's great to see. Um, so yeah, I think Top this man. is the way. <laughs> Brilliant. We have some quick fire questions that we always finish our interviews okay. with and I'm looking forward to these with you. What are the three non-negotiables that you and the people around you must buy into? Truth. Um, vulnerability and love. You, you know, being true to yourself, being able to be vulnerable and coming from love, you know, you're always going to find the right answer at some point and it, it, it can get streamlined in that way. And if I could have three and a half, I'd be like accountability too or acceptance, one of the two. Nice. 
What advice would you give to a teenage Danny just starting out? Uh, don't listen to anything. Just, no, I wouldn't say that. What would I say? Good luck. It's coming for you. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's coming for you. And, you know, at some point, it will all figure itself out. What is your biggest strength? And what is your greatest weakness? Mm. I'm pretty untidy. Um, my wife gets on to me about that, but I'm much better now. My greatest strength, my greatest weakness. You know, I, I guess it depends what circles you're asking. I guess vulnerability could be seen as a strength or weakness, but you know, it's allowed me to step into who I am and 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 own it. So I guess vulnerability covers both ends of the spectrum. What is one thing about what is one thing about you that we don't know that we should? Um, I don't know. I pretty much said everything. <laughs> uh, what don't you know about me? I went to Venice recently and we listened to this violin quartet. It was so moving, incredible. Like it was a game changer. I loved it. I'm a classical musical fan. Very nice. And <laughs> this is the final one, really. And this is your last message really to people that have listened to this. Um, what is your one final message to them for living a high performance life? Um, be true to yourself. Uh, accept things that come and from that place you can move through it and, and live and die in your passion. Like, mm. Go into it. Go into it. Give yourself, give it everything. Whether you get the outcome you desire or not, it will show you what you need to know about yourself. To live, to grow as a human being, to fulfill your potential in life because high performance is your whole life. It's not segregated to your mm -hmm. career or whatever it might be. So, you know, it's important that you use that in every aspect of your life and in doing so, You'll feel fulfilled, you'll feel in the moment, you'll feel present. And when life throws all the shit things at you, you'll be able to handle it. Fantastic. Great. I, I appreciate you guys inviting me on and uh, like I said, holding space. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Thanks man. man. Cheers, guys. Really appreciate it. Well done. Honestly, <laughs> amazing. Cheers, guys. Oh.